Alrighty guys, welcome back to another little video, and today, I, today I think it's about time we started having some fun again. Today, we're gonna build my Dream X58 PC. Stay tuned, let's have some fun. All right, guys, first of all, I wanted just to put out there uh, the first good while of this video is just me kind of putting the system together and kind of talking about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, it's not the most interesting. I will put the time uh, where to skip to the video if you just want to skip right to the B-roll and then benchmarks. But for the first while, it is literally just going to be me building the computer. Um, I figured I might as well say that before we get into this whole thing because the video does get a little bit long. So, um, yeah, thanks for watching. Stay tuned. Like, comment, subscribe, yada, yada, all that fun stuff. Alright, so my apology for looking like an absolute wreck today. It is about 85 degrees outside, but I decided that I didn't want to wait anymore. I decided that I wanted to start recording. So, what you guys are essentially looking at is what my original X58 PC was. Um, but there's been a few modifications. I actually took out the 12 gigs of Corsair XMS3 Platinum and replaced it with... Uh, 12 gigs of Samsung memory. Now this is nothing special. It should be DDR3-1600, like CL10, I want to say, at 1.5 volts. I'm really hoping that this Samsung memory overclocks pretty well, because I was having a really hard time with stability and overclocking with using the um, XMS3 Platinum. As you guys can see, I have some LED RAM heat sinks on there, and... I have my R9 Fury X inside the system. Now, I was debating between going with the R9 Fury X or my GTX 780, or hey, um, uh, a GTX Titan. I, I may have procured one of those for a very good price recently. But I decided that if I'm gonna be using this system and trying to actually get good use out of the system, now that the summer is coming to a close, I wanted to have a powerful GPU inside of it, primarily my most powerful water-cooled card that I own, my R9 Fury X. I also recently got an excess PC water block for the backplate, and yeah, that's pretty much it. My motherboard has not changed, obviously, because this is practically the best motherboard you can get in this form factor. Um, this is the EVGA SLI Micro, which is Yes, my dream motherboard that I have wanted for freaking ever. Then I have a 240mm radiator at the bottom and a 240mm radiator up front. Behind this radiator, which I don't think I'm going to be pulling out today, um, there is two... Um, what is it? Um, so right behind this radiator is uh, two low-profile 120mm fans from Arctic. The... Um, what is it, the Arctic P12s? These are the tw uh, 15 millimeter versions, so they are a lot shorter, meaning that there is a lot better air intake from the front of the case, or from the side of the case, I guess I should say, because I'm using low profile fans. They actually work pretty well for um, at front intakes, but I'm also gonna have bottom intakes and rear exhaust, as well as the power supply exhaust, which is right here. You can't really see it because it's kind of dark, I'm sorry. But yeah, that is practically what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to be finishing up this system, but there's a few things that I actually want to do to actually do this system upright. So underneath my water block is my i7-980X. And yes, I know it is not a Xeon. There is reasons that this motherboard cannot go for a Xeon, but I digress. I have an, I or an i7-980X. I'm going to actually lap that CPU today as well as replace the thermal paste with KPX. Um, this thing already has Noctua NHU or NH, what is it? They're higher grade thermal paste. I've had it on for a while, but it works pretty well. So I'm going to be switching over, um, the thermal paste as well as lapping the CPU to try and give it the best contact possible and try to uh, keep the temperatures as low as possible for allowing me to have a better overclock. Uh, that's the reason that I'm going with 12 gigs of RAM instead of 24. I actually do have another three sticks of RAM with RGB heat sinks on it. But when I did that, I was unable to get the RAM speed above, uh, I think it was 1400. So that is why I'm going with the, uh, 
the three sticks instead of the six. And also, I'm going to be switching out these uh, fans here. Primarily because I have really kind of been jaded by Corsair products. I mean, Corsair ML120s are not bad fans by any means. They're just not good. Compared to something like EK Vardars or um, Noctua, what is it, Noctua Redux fans, these uh, Corsair fans, they're just way louder and they don't push as much air. Now, what many of you are probably gonna say is gonna be a downgrade, but honestly, I really like these fans. These are some uh, cheaper fans you can buy off of Amazon, but they're actually really good static pressure, like a little bit better static pressure than these uh, Corsair fans. So I'm gonna be switching out to a three pack of these RGB fans, and I already have the RGB connector uh, put into the back. So I'm gonna need to swap my water pump off of this fan to put it onto that one. Uh, I'm going to pull off my CPU water block and I'm going to lap my CPU and then I'm just going to start, you know, just putting this thing back together, honestly, because it is, I think it's about time that it actually gets a little bit of love and focus on my channel because yet again, X58 is what I built my channel on and that's practically the only thing that I've ever known. Uh, oh, also, before I forget to mention, the uh, the case is my Inwin 301, and for storage, I have a one terabyte crucial. Uh, I have a one terabyte crucial SSD that is SATA three, and then I also have my uh, one terabyte uh, standard spinning hard drive. So yet again, nothing super uber fancy, but this is probably one of the best of the best configurations you can get for an x58 system barring you actually having a xeon that you can put inside of this thing but yeah for the most part i mean this is this is some of the best x58 stuff you can get so i'm just gonna start working and i'll keep you guys updated along the way all right i hope you guys are ready for a fun one because i am going to be uh disassembling this water block here Eh, I'm trying to do it one-handed. Primarily, because I want to see what the inside of this thing looks like. I've been running this system off and on with different coolants and different colored coolants for a couple of months now. It's actually been quite a few months, so I'm curious what the inside of this thing is going to look like. And the answer is, what the heck? That's pretty clean, actually. Like, there is a little bit of discoloration in a few of the micro fins down here. But I think that's just copper discoloration. I've actually seen that with a lot of these water blocks. Yeah, no, there is literally nothing clogging inside of those fins. That's impressive. All right. I was worried that this water block was going to be completely clogged up, but no, it looks totally fine. I mean, yet again, there's that little bit of discoloration right there, but that's not that's not like a buildup or anything. That's just some discoloration. All right. Well, that was uneventful. Never mind. Let's continue. All right, guys. So I'm actually kind of proud of this one. I decided that I was going to flush out both of the radiators, but I didn't want to end up pulling the radiators out. So what did I do? I hooked a tube to an inlet, I hooked this tube to an outlet, and I filled this tube full of water using my squeezer, and then it drained right into the sink. I just ran probably five or six of these things through the system, and now the water is coming out completely clear. I'm gonna give it a little bit of time to uh, fully drain out and dry. Then I'll probably end up running through one more time with some distilled, and then it'll be ready for coolant. All right, so I just spent the last hour lapping the water block. As you can see, there's a little bit of um, like layering here versus the rest of the block, but this part is just slightly lower than the rest of the block. And for the most part, the block is completely flat. So now I'm gonna move on to the CPU. I could spend a little bit more time on this, but being the fact that I'm lapping both of them, I'm, I'm not overly concerned about it. But yeah, this is, uh, 
this is looking pretty good so far. All right, so I am starting on the CPU and I've only done a little bit of sanding, but as you can see, there is a definite pattern forming. Now, as you can see, there is a more bare copper area in the middle towards the top and bottom, but then where the CPU retention thing clips down, it kind of forces the CPU to warp over time, making it very, very not flat. So this is why you want to lap a CPU, even though, yeah, I mean, it's not the safest thing in the world to do. As long as you do it right, though, it shouldn't cause any problems. But yeah, this thing is going to run probably a couple degrees cooler after this just because of actually getting really good proper contact. So I'm going to keep going with this. Um, the way that I lap a CPU is just by uh, taping down some sandpaper right to a glass side panel. But you kind of got to use a glass side panel you don't exactly care about. Um, a piece of glass or like a granite block or something that is notoriously flat is what you need to use for uh, lapping a CPU. If you don't have a flat surface, your CPU will not become flat. So I'm starting with 150, then I'll go up to 300, then I'll go up to like 500, then 1000, and then probably 2500 just to get it as smooth as humanly possible. And yet again, I know lapping a CPU takes a couple hours and it's not the most fun thing in the world to do, but in my opinion, for like a daily driver system, it's actually very, very good and a, like a good thing to do. So I'm just going to keep on at it and I'll be done sooner or later. Well, uh, as you guys can see, this thing is pretty much as flat as it's going to get. I could keep going on this thing to get rid of those two little silver spots, but for the most part, it's flat enough. And this is going to make our temperatures significantly more consistent and uh, quite a bit lower, actually. So, um, yeah. And my whole mess that I made. So, you know what? That's a thing. I think it's time to start putting this system back together. All right, all right, all right. She is back in the socket where she belongs. Still got all four of my pegs. Sticking on through the motherboard. And now time for some special KPX. Now, I've had a few people question why I spend a lot of money on thermal paste. Well, that's because thermal paste is one of the most important things in a computer build when it comes to thermals. You might think, oh, well, you can just buy a better cooler, right? Well, the cooler is only half the equation. If you don't have proper thermal contact between the CPU and the cooler, then you're not going to have a good time. To give you guys kind of an example, I first started using this thermal paste called H710. That was a cheap Chinese knockoff thermal paste that actually acted more as an insulator than a like legitimate thermal paste. I had a GTX 780 uh, thermal throttling at below stock speeds. Then after I changed the thermal paste over to some, I believe I used Arctic MX4, the system or the graphics card then started boosting to its proper boost table and the temperatures dropped about 50 degrees Celsius. And that's not even a joke. But... I think it's about time that I start slathering some good liquidy kingpin goodness all over this i7-980X. <coughs> <sighs> I recorded all of that about two weeks ago. Let's just say in that time I have gotten sick, gotten better, and now I think it's about time to finally get this thing done. I'm sorry this video has been a long time in the making, so let's do some beauty shots, let's go into overclocking, then let's get into the benchmarks. This tube is so bad! Oh, I need to redo that. I don't have time to do it today, though. Oh, that is so bad. Look at how crooked it is. Ugh, ugh, ugh. All right, back to the B-roll.
All right, so let's get into the overclocking settings that I have used to make this thing a little bit of a beast. Now, I know what people are going to probably say is, oh, Cross, if you would have gone for a Xeon, it would have gotten a lot higher, but yet again, can't go Xeon, so this is the best I've got. And the overclock that I've got here is a 26 multiplier, 156 on the base clock, and a just about 3.6 gigahertz on the Uncore. Now, I was able to get this up to a 27, which gives me 4.22 gigahertz, but the system became somewhat unstable at this overclock, so I simply decided to uh, drop it down to the 4 gigahertz, which was completely stable. And let's get into some synthetics and some actual benchmarks to show you guys what this thing is capable of, because it's actually kind of nutty. Like the memory speed, uh, I think it runs at like 940 uh, per channel, giving it an effective speed of like 2666. And this overclock, besides for doing rendering, is completely stable. Oh, I guess I should switch it back to the regular. This overclock is completely stable. Alright guys, but now that we've gotten done with the B-roll and the overclocking, let's get into the actual benchmarks, because that is where this video is really going to shine. So... The uh, first thing I need to go over is my operating system. I'm using Windows 11 uh, with the latest update patches. I forget exactly what the uh, update is, but it is 9.1 of 22, and I am running everything completely up to date. I also have the Spectre and Meltdown patches disabled to increase performance to its maximum potential. So, the first test that I ran was Cinebench R15, where I saw a 928 score on my overclock. So, I had had it a little bit higher when I had the uh, frequency higher, but yet again, I saw instability while playing games after playing games for a while. So, I decided to revert back to using the 4 GHz and then simply overclocked everything else to raise up the score to its 930, which is pretty much where I'm leaving it. Uh, the also thing that I needed to add to this, um, the Uncore frequency actually played more a part of, or played a bigger factor in the score than just the uh, CPU frequency. Uh, moving on over to the next test was Cinebench R15, where I saw just about 2,000 points, a 1971. So that puts us right about, if I'm remembering correctly, right about the same as like an i7-6700 non-K which is very respectable, although that is a 4-core 8-threaded chip that is non-overclocked versus a 6-core 12-threaded chip, but that test really does utilize the uh, AVX instruction set, so because of that, any x58 system just takes an absolute pummeling on Cinebench R20. But to move on to some more actual, you know, good benchmarks, or some benchmarks that actually show the capabilities of this system, I decided to run 3DMark. For uh, the first test that I ran, it was 3D Mark Extreme, where I got a 7,621, which is surprisingly good, uh, considering the fact that this was running uh, the Extreme version, which is just naturally going to be harder to run than the standard. Then the second test that I ran was 3D Mark Times Spy, where I got a 5,142. Yet again, a really respectable uh, scoreline, especially being the fact that really wasn't tuned all that hard. The system really wasn't pushing out that much heat. But now onto the actual games. The first game that I tested was a crowd favorite, Apex Legends. Now, I did not actually play the Battle Royale mode, I just played in the training grounds, but I also had accidentally left on V-Sync, um, but this game still ran at a constant 60 FPS, even with the V-Sync enabled. So, I thought that it was a perfectly playable experience, and I'm sure the actual Battle Royale mode might drop a little bit, but should probably stay right around the 60 FPS range. The next game that I tested was Borderlands 3. Now, this was the first game that I ever actually had problems with on this system. 
primarily because the FPS or the average FPS was actually quite high, as well as the fact that the frame time, according to the in-game metrics, should have been very good. But the game was plagued with random stuttering, primarily because of the game's uh, rendering, or the game's engine. I don't know why, but Borderlands 3 is the first game that I've ever ran into this problem. This game absolutely loves the AVX2 instruction set, so even if you have AVX, um, if you don't have AVX2, it just plagues the game with terrible performance. So anything pre i7 40 or anything pre like fourth gen Intel is simply not going to run this game very well. The actually second game that I ran that I had some severe trouble with was PUBG. Now I'm not sure if this was because of the overclock or just because it was PUBG, but I was doing a practice battle royale and the entire computer locked up and froze and crashed. So I was not able to get any footage of that, but for some reason PUBG just simply would not run on this system. Or at least it didn't run well in the situation that I had it set in. The next game that I tested was actually a really demanding one. Uh, I tested out City Skyline, but I didn't just test out City Skyline, I tested out the City Skyline Benchmark City which is one of the highest uh, capacity cities that I've ever seen in this game. And it managed a 30 to 40 average FPS, even in Benchmark Town. It was just wild to me that this was actually able to play the game quite comfortably. And this is a test that will bring most CPUs to their knees. Uh, the next game that I tested was Cyberpunk 2077. So for Cyberpunk 2077, I did this on 1080p medium settings uh, with low crowd density, and the game ran anywhere between like 48 to like 55 FPS, and it was absolutely playable, like surprisingly playable. Now, I've played through the entirety of Cyberpunk 2077 on a GTX 980 Ti inside of my Dell Precision T3500, which was running a W3680 at 3.8 gigahertz, so I was pretty confident that this system was going to be able to handle it. But this system was definitely being held back by the graphics card in this particular game. Instead of both GPU and CPU being pretty much maxed out, the GPU is pegged at 100% and the CPU is only pegged at about 30%, where the CPU could definitely give a much better experience if the GPU was just better, more capable for the task. That same story goes for Elden Ring, which was the next game that I tested. Elden Ring at 1080p medium settings, yet again, completely taxed the GPU while leaving the CPU relatively untouched. And this system was running anywhere between about 40 FPS to about 60 FPS. And the game looked fantastic while doing it. The only problem is, is that yet again, the GPU was fully holding the system back. If I had a more powerful graphics card to pair with the system, I'm sure I would have been able to find the CPU bottleneck instead of the GPU. But yet again, Elden Ring 1080p medium settings was perfectly playable. And now the final big game that I tested was Escape from Tarkov. Escape from Tarkov, I did at 1080p medium settings again, with MIP streaming on, and it was a perfectly acceptable, perfectly acceptable game experience. Um, I worked on, or I played on, uh, what was it, uh, Customs, I believe the map is called? I completely forget about this game. I have not played this game in months. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was running through customs, running through, like, a full lobby, and it was just, it was totally fine. So, now that I've kind of gone through some of the bigger games that I've tested, let's talk about some of the games that I myself play, because at the end of the day, this system was built for me. And the first game that I really want to talk about was Battletech. Now, Battletech is a turn-based strategy game with giant mech robots, and uh, technically they're mechs, they're not robots, I digress. This game was running at 1080p maximum settings, and it was just fantastic. Pretty much locked at a 60 FPS average in even some of the more intensive maps, and I was having a great time with it. 
Uh, another game that I wanted to test was Borderlands the pre-sequel, primarily because I actually like this game, and this game gave me a perfectly adequate gaming experience even while recording, which was, yet again, not the, not the story when it came to uh, Borderlands 3. Uh, Borderlands the pre-sequel runs on the same game engine as Borderlands 2, and so as long as this system could handle Borderlands the pre-sequel, it could definitely handle Borderlands 2. Uh, another game that I tested for myself was Destiny 2. Now, for Destiny 2, I played it on one of the most uh, demanding sections. I played it uh, in Gambit. Now, Gambit is where it is a kind of PvE, PvP style of uh, system. And I played through a couple rounds of Gambit, and I had absolutely zero issue with the uh, system. I was sitting anywhere between like 55 to 60 FPS on average, but yet again I had V-Sync on, so that helped out quite a bit with the uh, the averages. And yet again, just ran just fine. Another game that I am quite a big fan of is Dota 2. Now Dota 2, I just hopped into a live game and I was just watching some people play. They also had a Monkey King. So I could really check to see if uh, the Monkey King lag spikes were going to happen on the system, and they did not. Uh, Dota 2 ran absolutely perfectly at, I believe it was sitting anywhere between 140 to like 160 FPS. Um, yes, you could definitely have a higher FPS experience if you had a faster CPU, but overall it was a pretty, pretty good experience in my opinion. Completely competitive. Uh, another game that I tested that I actually really, really enjoy is Grim Dawn. Grim Dawn has kind of become a staple of my channel, and Grim Dawn was running at a locked 60 FPS, even inside of the Crucible. This is a essentially like Diablo-esque game that is far better than Diablo. If you guys like Diablo and uh, you hate Diablo Immortal, definitely give Grim Dawn a shot, because Grim Dawn is, in my opinion, the true successor of Diablo 2 and has been by far the greatest Diablo experience I have ever had. Even though this game's lore gets a little bit darker than Diablo's, and I didn't know that was possible, but you know, hey, I digress. The next game that I tested that I have just been playing the crap out of is RimWorld. I've probably sunk about 15 hours into this game while I was under the weather, and... Yeah, I played I played the crap out of this game on this system and I absolutely enjoyed every minute of it. Another game that I wanted to test just to have some fun was Star Wars The Old Republic, which is an MMORPG from 2011, so right about the same time that the CPU came out, and I was surprised at 2560 by 1080p ultra wide, this game ran anywhere between 90 to about 120 FPS. Just fantastic experience from a system from right about the time when it was released. Granted, the graphics card is much better, and yeah. One of the last games that I tested that I actually had problems with was the Elder Scrolls V, or the Elder Scrolls Skyrim. Skyrim has always been a really fun game in my opinion, but for some odd reason, whenever I would download a uh, graphical mods for this game, it would cause the game to stutter like no business or like nobody's business. The frame times were so atrocious that it is absolutely unplayable, but that was with graphical mods installed. Without the mods installed, the system ran absolutely fine. But here's a funny one. Fallout 4, with a bunch of graphical mods installed, ran absolutely perfectly, with absolutely zero issue. So explain to me how Fallout 4 can run great, but Skyrim can't? I don't know, that one's still new to me. Alright guys, so I think that'll probably do it for today. Um, let me know if you guys want to see more benchmarks on a system like this. Oh, I do plan on actually changing up this rig quite a bit in the near future. Um, I also have some bigger projects in mind. I also have some bigger projects planned. 
Uh, the next big project that I'm going to be working on and the next video I'm going to be doing is a review of my dual GTX 680 system, which has been my daily driver now for a while, and will probably go back to being my daily driver once I'm done with this video. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with that system, and that one's got a fun story behind it as well. But, yeah, I think that's probably all I got for today. This was just trying to do right by X58 and create a good PC that was actually going to perform relatively well. So, yeah, I guess I'll see you guys later. Peace.